welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. One of the least rewarding, most demanding, fruitless, pointless exercises in human emotions is revenge. Too often the avenger becomes the victim. The immortal bard tells us, Foolish it is to revenge oneself against a neighbor by setting fire to his house, for fire catches your own as well. No, there is no sweetness in revenge, but ashes in the mouth. Our mystery drama, Masks, based on a classic by Richard Marsh, is written especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene and stars John Beale. Revenge is as basic a theme as you will find in mystery or drama. The Old Testament testifies often on an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The great tragedies of the theater tell us that Othello lost his wife, Shylock his daughter, and Hamlet his life in that wild chase after justice. One man we know made many enemies when he was younger, which generally qualifies you for retribution. He is now riding a train from Dover up to London. I beg your pardon, sir. Do you mind if I join you in this compartment? Oh, not at all. I'm all alone. I had hoped to find an empty compartment on this train up to London, because I have some reading to do. But two compartments have noisy little children, and three have men puffing at odiferous cigars. And the compartment next to this one contains a nursing mother. I don't smoke. I gave it up years ago. I never started. Oh, that's a crutch. Well, I remember the days if I didn't smoke half a pack before I got to my office, I couldn't face the day. Oh, really? It must be in very strenuous and nerve-wracking line of work. Oh, yes, it did leave me pretty edgy, but I've retired now. May I inquire what it was? Well, I was head of Fountainhead Pictures. I'm John Fountain. My goodness, Yes. Your name and your movie company is a household word over here in England. Uh, my name is Arnold Lee. L-E-A. Lee? Well, that's an unusual spelling. And it's old English for thicket or shrubs. Oh, you're not in the wood business, are you? Oh, heavens no. I'm afraid I don't do much of anything. That's the penalty of being born well off with a large estate and farms and farmers to look after. I do have one business, a distillery in Scotland. Oh. So I keep occupied. Are you on vacation from Hollywood, Mr. Fountain? No, I'm looking for a place to settle down. A permanent home. I've left Los Angeles for good. I'm retired. And I'm looking forward to spending the rest of my days in a calmer atmosphere. Instead of cultivating money, I plan to cultivate my mind. Well, I don't know whether you'll find what you're looking for in London, Mr. Fountain. Mm, I shall see. And let comparison prove. Funny you should say that. Comparison proves It's our new advertising slogan. Oh. Lee's Scotch. You may have heard of it. Lee's Scotch? Well, I'm proud to say our Scotch has held a royal warrant for 90 years. I always carry a nip of it myself in a flask. Care for some? Well, that's very nice of you. Don't mind if I do. Top of the flask actually serves as a silver cup. Unscrew it and there we are. I shall have mine after you've tasted yours. I think you'll like it. As you say, Mr. Fountain, comparison proves. Oh, wow. That's, that's strong stuff, young man. What have you given me? I wish you'd stop pacing the room, Mr. Fountain. If I'm to ascertain the facts, I need you to recollect what happened on that train calmly and unemotionally. Well, Inspector Davis, I was alone in a first-class carriage on the Dover-London train. And a young man, very gentlemanly... Asked if he could join me in my compartment. Yes. Arnold Lee, he said his name was. He offered me a drink of scotch from a flask. And to tell you the truth, it, it had the kick of a mule. <laughs> it uh, <clears throat> knocked you out, as you Americans say. It was lethal. Next thing I knew, not, not, I'm not sure if I was dreaming then or not, but I, I thought I was being robbed. Well, now, surely you didn't come to the yard to report a dream. When I woke up, I found the dream had been quite real. Well, who was robbing you? The young man? Well, well, some strange kind of person or thing I'd never seen before. He took the keys from my pocket, pulled down my attaché case from the luggage rack, 
opened it and removed something, locked it, and put the keys back in my pocket. Finally, I did wake up, and I was alone. The train was just pulling into Victoria Station. What was missing from your case? A gold cigarette case. All the thief took was a gold cigarette case? Well, I thought that was strange, too. Uh, did you ever at any time see the face of the person who did all this? I don't know what was dream and what was real, and it, it didn't look human. It bent over like a, like some ape-like creature. I never saw its face. Well, we shall have a good search round to locate this Mr. Arnold Lee. I'm almost certain that what robbed me was not quite human. Did it make any sound? Yes, a horrible kind of growly laugh. I'll never forget that sound. Hmm. No one in the compartment but the young man. Well, he might have disguised himself to rob you. Oh, not him. Inspector, I've spent a lifetime casting people to type. He was no criminal. That boy was a gentleman. Well, we'll telegraph a description of the stolen property and the young man everywhere. And see what turns up. Where can I reach you? Well, for the present, I have a suite at London House. Excuse me, madam. How long have you been waiting for the elevators? Oh, two or three minutes. You mean two or three minutes before I came into the lobby? At least. No, perhaps more. I'm half a mind to go to the desk and complain. Oh, everything's a little slower in England. Well, you'd think in a hotel as expensive as London House, you'd have better elevator service. You're an American, aren't you? Yes, I am. Ah, here's our lift. You call it a lift, don't you? We call it an elevator. Uh -huh. Would you be good enough to press 11, please? Glad to. That's my floor, too. Yes. We use many words differently from you in America. <laughs> I expect I'll get the hang of it soon enough. It's a beautiful city you have here. I love London. You've been sightseeing, have you? No, I haven't had time. I've been house hunting. I've spent a long, rather tiring day. Really? You're going to make London your home? Are you going to hire or purchase? You mean rent or buy? <laughs> oh, there you are. What is it George Bernard Shaw said about your country and mine? England and America separated by a common language. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bid you good night, Mr. Fountain. Enjoy your stay. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, how did you know my name? Uh, I shall be happy to tell you some other time. Mine is Norell. Mrs. Ada Norell. Hello. Room service? This is John Fountain. Where's my dinner? I ordered it almost an hour ago. Hold on. There's a knock on the door. Probably the waiter. He certainly took his own sweet time. If this food is cold, I warn you, I'm sending him right back downstairs. Well, there's no one here. Where's my dinner? What is this? Hey, you! You down the end of the hall. Say, aren't you that young fellow who was in my train compartment? Hey, come back here. Son of a gun. That's him. Yes? Oh, it's you, Mr. Fountain. Oh, madam, I had no idea this was your door. Uh, my name is Ada Norell, I told you. I'm sorry. It, it's just that uh, oh, I, I do apologize for the late hour, but may I have just one word with your husband? With whom? Your husband, Mrs. Norell, the young gentleman I just saw going into this room. I hope you're joking, Mr. Fountain. Because if you're not, I hardly know how to take this. I, I, I just opened my door down the hall, and I thought it was the waiter with my dinner. And I saw, going down the corridor, a young man with whom I traveled yesterday on the train. Indeed. And when I called to him, he went down the hall and into this door. Uh, Mr. Fountain, I thought you were far more sophisticated than this. To make up such a transparent story in order to pursue me, <laughs> it's a bit obvious. I assure you, I... I, I swear, Mrs. Norrell, I had no idea this was your door. And I assure you, Mr. Fountain, nobody came in here. My husband passed away three years ago, and you are the only gentleman in this hotel with whom I have the slightest speaking acquaintance. I do hope we shall not be seeing one another again. Good night. <laughs> Yes, who's this? This is Inspector.
Inspector Davis, Scotland Yard. Oh. I'm downstairs in the lobby. Sorry to stop by so early in the morning, but I have some information I'd like you to verify. May I come up? Uh, Inspector, I, I wonder if you'd mind waiting for a few minutes. I, I, I just got up. Uh, what time is it? After nine, Mr. Fountain. Good heavens, I had such a terrible, sleepless night. I, I'll take a quick shower and get some clothes on it. Will you come up in, uh, say, ten minutes? I shall. I'm sorry to hear you had a bad night. Well, I thought when I came to England that the pressure and the strain in my life would disappear. But I, I, I have to tell you, Inspector Davis, I... I don't know. I haven't felt so dog-tired and washed up since I was in the middle of production in Hollywood. I thought those days were hard on me, but the past two days, I don't really like this. I've been subjected to some pretty strange goings-on. Would you mind telling me exactly what? Well, yesterday evening, I saw that young man who rode to London with me on the train, the, the one who gave me that drink. Oh, yes. Arnold Lee. You saw him? Yes, right on this floor, no less. He knocked on my door... I'm sure he did. And then ran down the hall and into the room of a lady I met here, a guest in the hotel. There's something going on, some kind of a game or something. She said he never went in there. Uh, this lady, is she a friend of yours? No, I just met her. She's extremely beautiful, a widow. And surprisingly, she knew my name. <laughs> I don't find that surprising. So did I, the moment you walked into the yard the other day. You knew me? My dear Mr. Fountain, your name as a movie producer is extremely well known. We in the British Isles are devotees of the flicks. But right now, I'm more interested in a lady's name. Mrs. Ada Norell. I did say, didn't I, that she was extremely attractive. Beautiful, in fact. Yes, yes, you did. Uh, well, this Mrs. Norell has nothing to do with my visit this morning. Well, you're on to something already? Have you located my cigarette case and that... that creature? We're not quite sure. Uh, you said for an instant you saw this person who was robbing you, but you were uncertain as to whether you saw the face. I show you this photograph and ask, is there any resemblance? Well, this... Where did you get this picture? But I... Um, oh, 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 pain. It's fine. Oh, help me. My, my, my chest. I can't, I can't breathe. Yes, you did. In my breast pocket, this... The pills. Right. So night and I shook. Chris, give me. Give, give me. A heart attack. A nitroglycerin pill to alleviate the pain. The inspector quickly places the tablet under the tongue of the gasping man. It will dissolve, and John Fountain will recover. But what was it about that photograph that shocked him so much that his heart was affected? I shall return shortly with Act Two. As with so many dramatic presentations on Mystery Theater, there's always more to the evidence than meets the eye. With that in mind, and making allowances for surprises along the way, we return to London House, where Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard has just shown a photograph to movie producer John Fountain to identify. For whatever reason, Mr. Fountain suddenly suffered a seizure of the heart. Mr. Fountain, how do you feel now? Oh, much better, Inspector. When they come, they come. So let me see that photograph again. Are you sure you feel up to it? Let me see it. Yeah. Study it carefully. Does it resemble anyone you've ever seen? I don't know. Not a very clear picture. Oh, she's terribly disfigured, poor thing. Yes. She was caught in a fire. When was that? Oh, six months ago. Are you sure? This woman escaped from Broadmoor. That's an asylum for the insane. She made her escape several hours before the London train you were on left over. Uh, we hazarded that she might have hidden herself on the train and it might have been she who robbed you. What's her name? We don't know. She had no identification. We call her Mrs. X. Why was she in Broadmoor? She'd set fire to one of the smaller movie houses in London. It was at night. She was the only one there. You're not saying that there's some connection with me because I used to be in the motion picture business, are you? Well, I'm not saying it's unconnected. Was there some 
particular movie being shown? Where, where was the fire? Well, she managed to get into the projection room. Tried to set fire to the film, but it wouldn't ignite. And then she went down into the lobby and lit a match to the drapes. They'd not been fireproofed. Uh, they were showing a revival of old movies that week. What movies? Yours, Mr. Fountain. What? A festival of the best of the Fountainhead pictures. <laughs> Ah, you're staying late tonight, Davis. Hmm. Oh, uh, typing up this John Fountain case, Chief. Uh, isn't this simple robbery taking an awful lot of your time? Well, I don't think it's that simple. I have an idea that Fountain's not a little paranoid. If he weren't such a VIP, perhaps it wouldn't matter. But he's got a bad heart, and he believes that everyone he meets is out there to get him. Hmm. Who does he think is after him? Well, several people. Eh? Someone who looks like Mrs. X. You remember the theater pyromaniac? And B, a young man he met on the Dover London train. And C, some other woman who lives at London House where he's staying and who he believes is in league with the young man. And all this over the theft of a cigarette case? Well, of course, there's more to it, Chief. Fountain is an extremely nervous man with a heart condition. If he's not imagining all this... It may be there are people in London at this moment who are intent upon driving him under. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, oh, driving him crazy? Under, I said. Under the ground. Driving him to his death. Glad you stopped by this morning, Inspector Davis. If you'd come a little earlier, we could have had breakfast together. Well, I'm glad to find you so chipper, Mr. Fountain. Well, things appear to be going my way. Ah, good. I've had some good luck since I last saw you. I found a nice little house on a nice little street off Welbeck Square, which I'm making an offer on. Well, your news is better than mine. My nice little streets have all turned out blind alleys. I keep thinking about what happened to me, Inspector. I had at least 250 pounds on me when I was robbed. Now, why wasn't that taken? Why just the cigarette case? Is that why I was drugged? For that? And Arnold Lee, where did he disappear to? He told me he came from a prominent family and he made Lee Scotch. Uh, there is no Lee Scotch, Mr. Fountain. There never was. Never was? Really? Is that true? I'm here this morning to ask you, is there something you haven't told me? I've told you everything I know. Tell me. Why does the loss of that particular cigarette case bother you so much? I'm sure you can afford many more. Uh, I attach great sentimental value to it, that's all. Why do you? It was given to me on my retirement from Fountainhead Pictures. Inside are inscribed all the names of those I made famous. Actors? Yeah, actors and directors and writers. All of them had their names engraved inside that cigarette case? Almost all. Some had died or, or moved away Got out of the picture business. If you'll excuse me, that might be my real estate agent. They may have accepted my offer. Hello? Mr. Fountain? Yes, who's this? Edith Norell. Oh, yes, Mrs. Norell. Are you still here at London House? I haven't seen you recently. I had a visit from Inspector Davis of Scotland Yard. You did? It was rather annoying. He questioned me about a young man you said you saw going into my room. Now, I don't know why you keep insisting on this, Mr. Fountain, but I can tell you I was very angry indeed. I am sorry, Mrs. Norell. How can I make it up to you? <laughs> well, at least you, you sound contrite. I am. I'll do anything so you'll forgive me. How about dinner tonight? And the theater afterwards, huh? No, that doesn't intrigue me. But if you'd like to accompany me on a visit to the Tower of London this afternoon, I suppose I could forgive you. The Tower of London? Why, oh, yes, I've never been there. Good enough. I shall meet you in the lobby at three. No, better yet, 2.30, right inside the Tower enclosure. Goodbye. I'll be there. Mrs. Norell, Inspector. She didn't like your questions. Oh, really? She didn't seem to mind at the time. She is, by the way, as extraordinarily beautiful as you told me. That woman. Had I met her ten years ago... I could have made her into one of the biggest stars ever to hit Hollywood. Mm -hmm. she's, she's got something. Not only an unusual and photogenic face, but a, a lovely manner. Yes, I could have made a big star of her. Uh, 
What did Mrs. Norell call you about? To join her sightseeing. I, I said I would. Well, if she upsets you that much, why do it? I don't know how to analyze it, but for some reason I'm drawn to that woman. A certain charisma, maybe. It, it's what we always look for in a movie actor. It, it has nothing to do with acting talent. Don't ask me why. I, I hardly know her, but she has that quality. Yes, <laughs> all right. So long as it distracts you. Uh, where, where are you going? The Tower of London. <laughs> Be careful. Don't get locked up in the dungeon. I said I was sorry, Mrs. Norell. I'm generally very punctual. Yes, I imagined you would be. I was just about to leave the tower when you arrived. Oh, please forgive me. An hour late is unforgivable, but I... I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I went down to hail a cab and suddenly... I, I didn't feel well. I had to sit down in the lobby. Are you serious? Perhaps you shouldn't have come out at all. Oh, no, no. I'm perfectly all right now. I just hope I haven't spoiled the afternoon for you. We don't have much time left before they close, and I did want you to see as much as possible. Look at all these towers in yes, here. Yes, actually 18 of them, all with different names, including the Bloody Tower. They say it was originally built by the Romans to honor Julius Caesar. Is that old? I like that. A country that respects its age and its old customs. Well, some of those old customs aren't that respectable. A lot of hanging and spilling blood right where you're walking. Really? Now, follow me down this spiral staircase to the dungeon. And the first room we come to is where the rack was. People were pulled apart for their crimes. Those bells. Oh, uh, that's the curfew. That means closing up time. Probably why we're the only ones down here. Well, what's that room behind this iron door? Oh, that's where the two little princes were kept before they were murdered. Well, let's pull the door open and have a look. It's it's heavy. Oh. I'll squeeze through here and have a look. Oh, there's so much more to see. It's a pity we I'll tell you what, Mr. Fountain. Suppose I go and find one of the yeomen and ask his permission for us to stay on a while after closing. And uh, don't go away now. Hey, the cell door's shut. Mrs. Norell? Mrs. Norell? Mrs. Norell? Is that you? Can you open the door and let me out? Oh, no. Oh, no, not you. Go, go away from me. Get away. Get away from here. Help. Help me! Help me! The nurse said it was all right for you to receive visitors. Uh, how do you feel today, Mr. Fountain? How long have I been in the hospital? Two days. I don't know what to make of all this. Well, if you're feeding up to talking today, I'd... I'd like to know what happened. I was going to ask you, Inspector... I don't usually wake up two days later and find myself flat on my back in bed. You've forgotten, Mr. Fountain? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, it was all a nightmare. Wasn't it? I didn't really see anybody, did I? Well, you had a seizure in the Tower of London. The guards came by and found you in the dungeon. Somehow you'd locked yourself in. Fortunately, it's happened before. A visitor gets very excited, releases the door, finds himself locked in, faints... And so they know exactly what to do. They whisked you off to London Hospital, and since you're an American, they called me. She did it. I'm sure of it. Who did what? Mrs. Norell. And then she sent that hideous creature to the cell. She came up to the door and laughed at me. Uh, can you be more detailed? Well, the door to the dungeon has a little window cut into it. I was calling for help. Then all of a sudden, this demented face appeared in that little window and laughed at me. Had you ever seen this person before? I, I don't know. Was she the creature that robbed you on the train? I, I don't know. Don't ask me. Mr. Fountain, in that dungeon in the Tower of London, you were heard to say, you, you, go away from me, get away. It sounded as if you knew who it was. Now, who was it? I, I tell you, I don't know. Mr. Fountain, we can't help you if you don't help us. Now, bear in mind, the Yard has taken everything at face value. There have been no confirming witnesses. It's all your story. 
There are those at headquarters who have definite doubts that you ever had a cigarette case, or that it was stolen, or that you were drugged by a young man on a train. Why would I say all those things if they weren't true? It was that mad woman, the one you called Mrs. X. And do you know her? Mr. Fountain, answer me. Yes, I did know her. But so help me, God, I... I had nothing to do with it. I tried to help. Why, after all these years, did she come back into my life to make me remember? I, I, I don't think my heart can stand much more of this. I mean it. I won't be responsible if I ever see her again. I think we're beginning to see the elements of a tale of revenge. The cast of characters, a retiring movie magnate, a widow of extraordinary beauty, a young man on a train, and a Mrs. X, a woman with a disfigured face. Could it be that what began as a simple robbery may have consequences beyond imagining? As I've often told you when we are two acts into the plot, wait and see. I shall be back shortly with Act Three. It is that act in which the evidence is assessed, problems solved, and the villains get their comeuppance. But what if your story has no villains, no heroes? Yet the mystery of what has been going on is as puzzling as ever, which is precisely the situation that faces Scotland Yard. We are closing the case, Davis. We spent far too many hours chasing a, a will-o'-the-wisp. Yes, and he's not a well man, Chief McGowan. Yeah, that may be, but it's not our concern. I've got something for you more immediate. A certain Ralph Glass arrives at Heathrow on the noon flight. I'd like you to interview him, find out why he's in England. What are the leads, sir? Mm. Do you remember the Mrs. X case, the woman who escaped from Broadmoor? Certainly. I was hoping she was connected with a fountain robbery. The incredible part of that case is the woman's completely dropped out of sight. Unbelievable. Here she is, presumably with no money, escaped from incarceration. How is she existing? What has she got to do with glass? Well, it's a tenuous lead, but we've got to go with it. When we examined your room at Broadmoor, we found some doodling in a corner on the windowsill. You know how people will scratch away with a pencil while they're thinking... Well, she hadn't been permitted a pencil. Naturally, anything sharp was kept from her. It was just the same. There on the sill were scratches. Two words. Ralph Glass. Why did she write that name? And that's your assignment, Davis. You checked the incoming airlines, huh? The name came out of the computer. Twelve o'clock. Hop to it. Heathrow. Who is it? Mrs. Lowell. What do you want? To see you. How are you? All right. Come on in. Thank you. We can talk in the sitting room, part of the suite. I I was just writing a letter. I'll sit here by the window, John. I'm going to call you, John. And if you care to, you may call me Ada. What do you want to see me about? You're angry at me, aren't you? Somehow you're thinking it was my fault. You getting locked up in the Tower of London. Ada... You have me at a disadvantage. I've told you before, you're a very attractive woman. And if I'd met you years ago, you might have become a movie star at my studio. Not everyone wants to be a movie star, John. But I shall take it as a compliment. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I came back to the dungeon that day to find out you'd fainted and been taken away to the hospital, I was beside myself. Nobody would tell me which hospital... And finally, after calling every hospital in the phone book, when I located you and was told John Fountain had suffered from a heart attack, well, you, you don't know how I blame myself. Well, I don't know what to say. I guess I'm very surprised. So we've made up, have we? Well, sure. Sure we have. Are you dining in the hotel alone tonight? Well, I don't know that I feel up to going out or even into the dining room. Suppose I order a light dinner for the both of us and have it brought up to my room. After all, you won't have to walk far. I'm just down the hall. Okay, Ed. That's very nice of you. And and forgive me for... for 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> You're forgiven. I'll see you at seven, then. Are you Ralph Glass? Uh, yes, yes, I am. I, I was told by customs to come into this office. Yes. I'm Inspector Davis, Alien Division, Scotland Guard. Oh. Uh, may I see your passport, please, sir? Oh, uh, yeah. Mm hmm? Is there an address where you can be reached? Well, I I'll be staying at the London house. I note you list your occupation as makeup man. Uh, you're not planning to conduct any business of that nature while you're here, are you? No, not at all. I, I do makeup for the movies. Yeah, I haven't come here to work. Uh, are those your bags the porter's just brought in? Oh, yes. Yes, they are. Just put them down there, will you please, porter? Thank you. You may go. Mr. Glass, would you mind opening your luggage? Oh, not at all. Do you think I'm smuggling in something? The smaller suitcase first, please. What are these, Mr. Glass? Uh, those are facial masks. What are they made of? Oh, very thin painted latex. An invention of mine. I see. What do you do with them? Well, when an actor has to play an older person or a disfigured person, we use these masks instead of makeup. You see, it's very pliable. Your own skin can breathe through them, and they're as lifelike as a human hand can make them. Indeed. I hold this one up. Extraordinary. I do believe it resembles a lady I interviewed quite recently. Mm -hmm. I would say this is no ordinary character makeup. These masks are works of art. I've been waiting an hour. Did your plane get in late, Ralph? No, I had a run-in with the British Customs. And then an interview with Scotland Yard. What did they want? Mm, I don't know what he was after. I had to open my suitcases. Probably drugs. You? Smuggling drugs? That's a spot check. Every so many passengers tag, you're it. Now, what is it you want from me? Now, that's a nice way for a brother to talk. Well, I didn't fly 3,000 miles for chit-chat and compliments, Lorna. Is he here? Yes. Right down the hall, in fact. Are you sure you want to go through with this? I haven't waited ten years for nothing. What did you bring? A couple of extras and the new one of Lorna Dale. I'll show you. Get the suitcase under the bed. Here's a spare mask of Ada Norell. Good. The one I'm wearing is getting a little cracked around the mouth lines. I brought along a duplicate of Arnold Lee, in case you needed that mask. Yes. There'll be one final performance from Arnold. And here's what I've spent most of my time on. The mask of Lorna Dale. Let me look at it. Lorna Dale. Oh, is this what I used to look like? I almost don't remember. Dearest sister, you were very beautiful. Oh. I worked from the early stills and my memory. I could never forget the way you looked before the accident. Ralph, these masks are wonderful. But I need your personal help. I want you to stand by me. He's coming here at 7 o'clock. John Fountain? Yes. I told you he's staying just down the hall. He's coming to have dinner with Ada Norell. What are you going to do? Throw his sins into his face and watch him suffer the way he made me suffer. <laughs> It's me, Ada. John Fountain. Oh, come in, John. I'm just finishing dressing. Where are you, Ada? I'm in the bedroom. Be out in a minute. Fix yourself a drink. Thank you. Can I fix you one? Well, I've ordered wine with dinner. I'll wait for that. Uh, I'll just have a whiskey and soda. I have a surprise for you, John. A visitor to see you. Say... Aren't you... Yes, indeed. Arnold Lee. How do you do, Mr. Fountain? What is all this? Do you remember your gold cigarette case, Mr. Fountain? I have it. Not so fast. Don't be grabby. I'll read you the inscription. With affection and respect to the founder of Fountainhead Pictures. And it's signed by all those nice people you put on the map. All but one. Who is that, Mr. Fountain? I thought you stole it. Give me that. Oh, sorry, I dropped it. Oh, how careless of me. I squashed it flat by stepping on it. Good 
goodbye. I have to go now because there's someone else who wants to say hello. Ralph, your old boss, John Fountain, is here. Come on out to the bedroom. Hello, John. Remember me? Ralph Glass? Well, of course I do, Ralph. You were in makeup. What are you doing in London? Lorna asked me to come say hello. Said there'd be a reunion. Lorna? Yes. Lorna Dale, my sister. The most beautiful girl in the lot. Don't you remember her? Oh, sure. Sure. How, how is she? Don't you know? She was in the cabin up at Arrowhead with you when it caught fire and you ran out. You saved yourself, remember? It wasn't my fault. The kerosene stove just tipped over. It wasn't your fault that you got out without a scratch? And Lorna was so badly burned they could never fix her face again? Not your fault? Why are you doing this to me? I've left Hollywood. Why are you over here to tell me this? I know, John. You're trying very hard to escape. But things keep happening to you, don't they? <laughs> How would you like to see Lorna Dale right now? Oh, no. No, please. Yeah, you have no choice. Lorna? Would you come in, please? Hello, John. Long time no see. Oh, Lorna. Oh, you're beautiful. You haven't changed at all in all these years. Remarkable, isn't it? Considering what my face looked like after the fire. I had no idea plastic surgery could be so... so restorative. I, I don't believe it, Lorna. Not a mark on my face, is there? Look closely, John. Fantastic, no? Now, I want you to keep looking. Ralph, help me off with this, will you? Now, look, John. Does this face of Lorna Dale look more familiar to you? Or did you prefer the mask of Lorna Dale? Oh, oh no. 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 You'll never forget now. You'll never be the same. There's just one more scene to play, Ralph. Is that why you're wearing your Ada Norrell mask? It's the one... A certain gentleman knows me by. I telephoned him before to ask him up. Do I know him? If you don't, you will in ten seconds. Ah, Inspector Davis, it was good of you to stop by so late at night. The yard doesn't keep ours, Mrs. Norrell. Uh, this is my brother, Ralph Glass. Oh, yes, we oh. met. But I didn't know you were related. I... I asked you here to confess to setting a fire, escaping from an asylum, engineering a robbery, and almost, but not quite, worrying a man to death. Inspector, did you ever hear of a motion picture actress called Lorna Dale? I certainly did. I had a crush on her all through school. What happened to her? She and the studio head were caught in a fire in a mountain cabin years ago. Did she die? Only her face. Inspector, I want you to write three names down on a piece of paper. Go ahead. Arnold Lee, Ada Norrell, and Lorna Dale. And then take a very close look at those three names. Mrs. Norrell, I already have. Oh? The names Arnold Lee and Ada Norrell and Lorna Dale are all the same anagram. The same letters transposed to make three different names. It was I, the same person, transposed to make three different people. But how could you? Ralph, show Inspector Davis the masks. Of course, those masks. Now I see a fire, a burnt face. Mrs. Norrell... You are really Lorna Dale. Yes, I am. I hope you will let me pay for the damages to the theater and for escaping from the madhouse. I am not crazy. May I call you Lorna Dale? Of course. Miss Dale, I can straighten out matters with both the Yard and Broadmoor. I think you've... I think you've suffered enough. I'd better be on my way now, but... I shall never forget your three performances. Your three people. In three masks. 
Remember the old maxim that went, revenge is like a boomerang, though for a time it flies in the direction it is hurled, it takes a sudden curve, and returning can hit your own head with quite a blow. Not this time, though. I shall be back shortly. Rather than leaving you believing that revenge is sweet, or that I endorse revenge in any shape or form, let me say that the best manner of avenging ourselves is not by resembling him who has injured us. Yet, men are not gods, and often it is indeed difficult to turn the other cheek. Our cast included John Beale, Court Benson, Joan Shea, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.